International Radio. From Israel to the world. Hello and welcome. You're listening to IDC International Radio here on 106.2 FM. I'm Sabrina Zalouf, and with me in the studio today, I have the great pleasure of interviewing Professor Baz Ganor, who is um, the head of the Institute for Counterterrorism, the chair of the annual summit on counterterrorism, the World Summit, and of course, the dean of the Lauda School of Government. So welcome to the studio. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you for having me. Uh, pleasure. So uh, really, we're just a, a couple of weeks ahead of this World Summit, and it's uh, something that's super exciting uh, that's happening really in the world now because there's a lot of talk about terrorism, unfortunately, but it wasn't always this way. Tell us a bit about how this whole idea of counterterrorism came about. Where did it come from? You mean the whole idea of creation of the ICT, the International Pol Policy Institute for Counterterrorism, because if we are talking about the whole idea of terrorism, it didn't come in my mind. It came uh, in the mind of the terrorists themselves. Uh, in 1996, uh, 21 years ago, I was actually uh, coming with this idea together with uh, a few of my colleagues and friends, uh, the chairman of the board of directors, Shabtai Shavid, the former head of the Israeli Mossad, and some other distinguished members of our board, we came with this idea to Professor Uriel Reichmann, the president of the uh, university, the president of IDC. And the idea was to create an academic institute, center of excellence, who would deal with this subject matter of terrorism uh, from different academic perspectives, or if you, you wish, with different uh, tools of academic dif uh, different academic disciplines. Now think about it. Any academic discipline, almost, has relevancy to terrorism, psychology, sociology political science, law, criminology, computer science, biology, chemistry, medicine, philosophy, theology, you name it, all has to do directly or indirectly with terrorism. And that's why we thought there is a need to bring to the table academic excellence with practical experience in counterterrorism. And where is a better place to do that than Israel, the interdisciplinary center in Israel, which taking the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach as the base of its activity, and uh, this uh, was done five years before the subject matter of terrorism became known and popular in the academic arena, bef five years before 9-11. Right, after that's 9 the, the pivotal event. Exactly. The, th that was the game changer. The, uh, after 9-11, the um, United States created the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, which created different centers of excellence for counterterrorism. Some of them actually followed the footsteps of ICT. And since then, almost every civilized state around the world has at least one center of excellence is dealing with counterterrorism. We have been there before them. We are bringing to the table the Israeli special practic practical experience on top of the academic excellence. And I'm quite satisfied with what we do here uh, at the Interdisciplinary Center. Yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. Um, now, one can't talk about terrorism without addressing, you know, the last year, especially in Europe, and most specifically recently in Barcelona. How, w w what, are, what is really the, the core of the main challenge that the West faces today? Well, we cannot uh, uh, squeeze the core of the challenges into uh, a short program like yours, mm -hmm. but I would uh, suggest, actually, to, to put the situation in Europe today in, in a specific uh, uh, order, a specific point of view, if you wish. And I uh, would refer to that by using classification of different attacks. In the recent years, we saw uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, quite a lot of terrorist attacks occurs in, in Britain, in France, in Belgium, in other places altogether. And the question is, what is the rationale behind them? Uh, who are the perpetrators of those attacks? And I suggest to differ between three types of perpetrators the lone wolf attackers, the local independent networks, and the organized cells or sleeper cells of terrorist organizations. Different uh, uh, types of terrorism altogether, although have some common denominators. The lone wolf is an individual who has been radicalized personally, usually uh, via the internet or by some personal acquaintances, and one day he decides to commit a terrorist attack. He, uh, he's radical enough in order to commit a terrorist attack. He has two options, by the way. He either can pack up his things and travel to Syria and uh, Iraq and become a foreign fighter, or to become a homegrown terrorist on his own territory. Until uh, a year ago, flying to Syria was, seems like an attractive uh, goal. Today, when ISIS is losing uh, uh, the territories, um, this is not that attractive, so they prefer more and more to become homegrown terrorists. Do you think they can do both? Do you, d 
Is there a phenomenon of people leaving hardly, and coming back? Hardly, because yeah, there is a phenomenon like that, but either in most cases you would die mm -hmm. if you would fly to Syria and, and uh, participate in the battlefield, or you would lose your appetite for further terrorist attacks when you come back to... Uh, to civilization. Uh, to civilization. And if you will come back, by the way, you would not come back as a lone terrorist anymore. Then you would be part of the organized cell that mm -hmm. has been sent to the mission by the terrorist organizations. Now, the lone wolves usually are using cold weapon, either stabbing or using axe or run down uh, using the cars. The local independent network is usually uh, using uh, um, um, improvised uh, devices like explosives, uh, sometimes uh, improvised uh, uh, guns or, or shootings, and also cold weapon. Organized cells uh, usually use uh, much more sophisticated bombs and especially suicide attacks. Um, what we saw in Barcelona recently seems to be, I'm hesitating to uh, give a total judgment because it's still uh, being investigation. investigated, but seems to be as a local independent network. What makes it different than other uh, local independent networks that conducted those attacks is that this is a big network. It's uh, 12, at least 12 uh, participants. Usually it's two, three, four, five, not more than that. And uh, uh, also that they were uh, ready to commit big attacks and not just stabbing and running mm -hmm. down and maybe uh, an improvised explosive they device. They had a, here or a there. big plan in a place. A big plan altogether. Now the question, do they have any operational ties to ISIS? My gut feeling says that the answer is no. They are being inspired by ISIS. ISIS is immediately ready to take responsibility. Why not? This it's credit is, uh, for them. Credit uh, free of charge. But at the same time, I think it's, uh, it's an independent network. Very interesting. You speak about uh, kind of motivation and how ISIS will take credit because it could be that these people were motivated online by ISIS. And in your research, you speak a lot about reducing uh, motivation as well as reducing operational capabilities. Right. But in actual... In actual reality, is it possible to reduce motivation in the long term, especially when you're facing extremist ideology like ISIS? Maybe I'm naive, but <laughs> I believe that the answer is positive. Uh, maybe even the term reducing motivation is misleading in a way. I'm not a great believer in de-radicalization programs. There are many de-radicalization programs in different countries around the world. De-radicalization naturally refers to a radical person that you want to de-radicalize him. That's reducing his motivation. Correct. Very difficult. I'm a great believer in prevention of, ra of radicalization. If you take a person before he's been radicalized and then find a way to prevent the negative process, the dangerous process that makes him a radical person, this could be done in different aspects, and I, uh, I believe that the, it could be very effective. You could deal with the... Uh, uh, the internet uh, services providers, the, the, the they would stop the incitement, the propaganda that radicalized those mm -hmm. people. You can and you should find a way to bring to the table the counter-narrative. And the counter-narrative cannot be given to the potential uh, target audiences, not by you, Sabrina, not by me. It should come from Muslims mm -hmm. and especially from religious pundits, uh, religious clerics. Uh, uh, that has some merit in uh, their uh, uh, statements. Um, the question is why we don't see enough efforts like that within the Muslim, the Muslim world itself. And how do you actually promote such a, a, an important positive process? Well, do you think the reason we don't see enough is perhaps because, unfortunately, a lot of the kind of the religious institutions that are branded as moderate or as modern uh, are actually, they do have certain sympathies towards this kind of ideology? I think that I would give another explanation to that. And I think that this is more a Western mistake. Uh, until recently, uh, under Obama in the United States and coming from many European countries, the understanding that there is a need to build a counter-narrative was there. Obama understood that, Europeans understood that. Um, the understanding that you should refrain from uh, pushing moderate Muslims today to identify f with the radicals was there. The understanding that you need to bring to the table Muslim religious cleric that would present the counter-narrative was there. 
The question was how to do that. And unfortunately, at least from my point of view, most of the efforts came to this mission with apologetic uh, uh, strategy. Uh, God forbid, not to uh, offend, insult, not right. to offend, political correctness. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think, and I think it needed to be said, I don't think that the problem is with Islam. Unlike some of my colleagues, some of them I appreciate very much, that believe that the problem is with this specific religion, I don't think that this is the case. I think that the problem is within Islam. The problem is by the misinterpretation of Islam, by certain type of people, we call them the Islamist, Salafist, mm -hmm. uh, jihadist, uh, terrorist, and their, um, the ideologists that supports them, that they misinterpret some article, misuse those articles in order to provoke youngsters, confused youngster, youngsters within the Muslim communities to conduct those activities. The question is how do you bring the moderate, the vast majority of the Muslims to stand against that? Are you going to come with apologetic way or you're going to say this is your mission, this is your obligation. You don't do any favor to me or to anybody else by doing that because you believe in moderate Islam. Because you believe in uh, jihad is doing good deeds and not those atrocities of beheading innocent civilians. So in order to protect your own religion, you need to do that for right. your own sake, not for my sake or for the sake of anybody else. Because of course the, you know, the majority of the victims of Islamism and terrorism today are Muslims themselves. So D That's one. And even if the, the majority, which is not the case, was the victims of other religions still, I think that the, the moderate, uh, uh, genuine Muslim believers should stand against that because any attack against any civilian around the world should be uh, uh, forbidden by any religion, by any uh, uh, organization. But I think what many people struggle to grasp with is that if we say the majority of Muslims uh, are moderate and they don't support this radical ideology, you don't hear the, the majority That's coming the out against... So it's, it's difficult to reconcile and say, oh, they came with the wrong approach. It seems almost that they don't want to. That's the problem. And uh, the fact is that they don't want to. The question is, why don't they want to? And mm. how you, motivi how you uh, motivi motivate them? I don't think that with apologetic messages you would motivate them. I think that by actually demanding that from them for their own sake to do that, that might lead to another uh, approach and another reaction from the vast majority of the Muslims around the world. We try the apologetic way. Maybe it's about the time to, uh, to try it differently. And not going to the position, which I don't believe in mm -hmm. it, by incrementing Islam as a religion, as an illegitimate, as a radical, as a violent religion altogether. That's not the way to achieve that, but not the apologetic way. Somewhere in the middle. Exactly. Um, okay, so you've told us a lot about, I've picked your brains, but I want to hear more about the summit. Uh, this year, first of all, how long, how, how did the idea came, come from this Institute of Counterterrorism to actually create a world summit? Why? ICT was created in 1996, 21 years ago. And a few years after that, we understood that terrorism is not just a growing phenomenon. It's not just an interdisciplinary phenomenon. Terrorism is a global phenomenon and the, gro and, and the phenomenon that will spread in other countries as well. So the slogan that we used uh, back then and after that was adopted by distinguished speakers around the world was that it takes a network to beat a network. And uh, that's what we are trying to do in this global summit on counterterrorism for the last 17 years. Yeah. This is the 17th conference. Um, we have created uh, this summit in order to create a new community, the international community of counterterrorism. That's what we do in the coming September between the 11th to the 14th of September, every, every year we do it on the week of the 11th of September, we would have hundreds of experts from all over the world coming to IDC, coming to Israel, uh, for the purpose of creating and promoting this international network of counterterrorism. It's a combination of scholars on one hand, practitioners, heads of security services, police departments, military, mm -hmm. uh, and decision makers, politicians, diplomats from all over the world, together with the private sector, uh, um, elements coming from the private sector, dealing with counterterrorism as well, mingling for four days, listening to the best lectures of uh, the best experts, and also participating in war games, in simulations, in workshops, in order really to share experience mm -hmm. of different states, of different agencies around the world, 
in counterterrorism. So uh, can you tell us a bit of a few of the keynote speakers that people can expect to hear? We have uh, a very long list. We have more than 100 speakers wow. uh, which are going to be there. So it's very difficult to uh, pick up one or two. I don't <laughs> want others to be mad at me. On top of the Israeli uh, uh, heads of um, different agencies and, uh, and ministries, uh, ministers uh, in Israel that will join us, we would have, uh, for example, uh, Sebastian Gorka, who is the advisor uh, to uh, the American president for counterterrorism, which will speak about the new constructing uh, counterterrorism policy of the United States that probably going to be revealed uh, just before, immediately thereafter wow. the, uh, the conference. Uh, we are going to have the uh, um, head of the Department of Homeland Security in New York State, um, wow, a, that's, a, that's, a, a commissioner, that's a big responsibility. A commissioner <laughs> that has a, a big responsibility and actually personally was involved in 9-11 in uh, 2001. Wow. He would share this experience uh, with us. We will have uh, distinguished speakers coming from Europe, uh, Italy, uh, France, Spain, uh, and Germany and many other countries altogether. So it's definitely going to be a world summit, definitely got the global aspect. Sure. And this year, the, the name or the, the focus is actually Amaze, is mm -hmm. that correct? Mm -hmm. Why, what was, the, what was the idea behind that? We uh, believe that um, counterterrorism is not just a profession. Counterterrorism is not just uh, uh, expertise. Counterterrorism is an art. An art of understanding different uh, alternatives, different uh, uh, doctrines. The art of understanding the dilemmas and the paradoxes that has to do with counterterrorism and finding the right balances in counterterrorism. A maze actually reflects the challenge. Mm -hmm. The challenge is a maze. If you take a lay person and w you would put him in, in the need to confront terrorism, he would be in a maze. The whole goal of uh, this international community that we create in the World Summit is actually leading the decision makers and the lay people from that maze into the right uh, um, uh, exit oh, of, okay. uh, <laughs> of, of, of the maze, understanding the much better the phenomenon and finding better practices and policies and doctrines in, in countering uh, uh, terrorism and perhaps also understanding that they're in a maze in the first place that's the fr that's the first uh, <laughs> need of course um someone who let's say attended the conference last year what th there have been a lot of changes as we said at the beginning in terrorism itself what changes can be seen in the from the counter-terrorism side the immediate uh, um, the immediate impact is that we created this global network we have today people which are coming for the 10th year, one after the other, uh, uh, or people which are coming again and again. Why? Because now a commissioner of police from London, for example, that used to come on a yearly basis, can pick up the phone and talk to a commissioner of police in Australia or in India. Um, they probably could do it before, but they didn't know each other mm -hmm. on a personal name basis. They didn't interact with each other. You know, I remember one of the um, conferences that we held here, we had a few heads of uh, the American Centers of Excellence for Counterterrorism. The DHS uh, created few American Centers of Excellence for Counterterrorism. Academic institutions? Academic institutions that actually in some way even, even uh, took ICT, our institute, as the model. Uh, so s some of those heads of those institutes were spending those four days here. At the same time, the head of the Department of Science and Technology of the DHS was here as well. She is the one, Maureen McCarthy, back then, that was responsible for the grants that they're getting. Now, they tried to meet her in Washington, D.C. They couldn't, but when they came here, they can hang uh, around with her <laughs> and speak with her. At the same year, we had the second uh, uh, in command of the FBI, the acting uh, person, and Maureen McCarthy comes to me and says, you know, this guy of the FBI, his office is two blocks from my office in Washington, D.C. I wanted to meet him for so many months altogether. I couldn't do it, but I can do it here. Wow. So the barriers are falling here. You have interaction that you would never have, and this creates really the bond in this uh, global network of counterterrorism. So 
I guess it's almost comforting to know that as the terror networks get even more developed and interconnected in themselves, uh, so does the counterterrorism network. At least that's what we are trying to do. Um, really, this has been such a treat to be able to, to hear all of this before the conference itself. Um, I really encourage all of our listeners to listen and tune in and to come to the conference itself. We'll be covering it here at the IDC International Some Radio. Some of it will too. be covered live. Yes, uh, yes. And, uh, you can use the uh, ICT uh, Facebook Live. Uh, Facebook uh, yeah. for that purpose. Uh, and yeah, so it's on the 11th to the 14th of September mm -hmm. uh, here in Herzliya. We've got over a thousand experts coming, and it's going to be uh, definitely something super exciting. We're very much looking forward to the conference, and thank you for coming to speak with us, thank Professor. Thank you for Gale. having me, Sabrina.